Well, good morning. Wow, there's so much more of you now than there were 10 minutes ago. Y'all like have multiplied like some sort of fungus. I don't, sorry, Clarkson's farm is on repeat in our house and he's growing funguses and so that just immediately popped into my head. Y'all are beautiful creations of the Lord. Glad you're here. Um, my question for you this morning is, are you okay? <laughs> but really, like right now, take a moment um, and are you okay? It's, it's a question of like some form or shape that we ask each other regularly around here and I hope that we'll continue to ask each other regularly. It usually is phrased something like this here at Redemption. Hey, how was your week? Uh, and the culture of redemption is to actually pause, reflect, and then give an honest answer to that. And if you're new to redemption and you ask someone, hey, how was your week? And they give you the real honest response. You might be taken aback at first where you're like, whoa, whoa. Man, I was not expecting that. But are you okay? There is a notion, and it pops up in all sorts of strains of religion, that suggests you ought to be okay. A theology of self-help, if we will call it that. Right, and you probably have in your head some idea of what I mean when I say that, but, but I can assure you this pops up in uh, conservative churches, this pops up in progressive churches, this pops up in other religions. And it is a reduction of what God has done in the person of Jesus Christ to merely giving us a positive sense of self. That is, the story of God become human living and dying a brutal, humiliating death, being raised from the dead and ascended into the presence of the Father while present with us here by his Spirit is reduced to a story that will give us a better day. It's reduced to a story that will just make you okay. And if this is the story, if this is the goal of Jesus and what Jesus is doing among us and in us and in his churches throughout the world here and now on this Sunday morning, then our life becomes something along the lines of the goal is to be okay. And our gathering together each week then becomes this optional thing. Maybe we need a little injection of encouragement. I'll go to church today. Maybe we need a little bit of optimism. I'll go to church today. Maybe we're just a little lonely. We need to see some people. I'll go to church today. But church, our gathering, becomes this way that we get some sense of okayness, however you might want to define that in the moment. And we see this, if I can be cynical for just a moment, me never. We see this most directly in many of our modern worship songs, which proclaim the work of Christ is here to heal us from our depression, to heal us from our anxiety, to heal us from our illness, a Christ who exists to make you feel better. But Ephesians tells a different story, a bigger story. Christ is not resurrected so that you can feel better about yourself. Christ is resurrected to put asunder the demons of the world. Christ is resurrected to defeat sin and death. Christ is resurrected so that sin and death no longer have dominion over us. His story, the one that Ephesians tells, is far bigger than just okay. A God who has come not simply to make us okay, but to renew the very fabric of the cosmos. Jesus came to heal the sick, to release the captive, to give sight to the blind, and to give life to the dead. Jesus did not come to make us okay. And this is important because I know for a fact that many of you in this room here this morning are not okay. And I need you to hear from someone who may or may not be okay in this moment that it's okay to not be okay. Okay? There are many of you in this room this morning who are confronting tremendous darkness real life-altering evil. There are many of you in this room who are facing the horrific nature of untreatable, lifelong illnesses, unimaginable diagnoses, 
There are many of you in this room who are confronting the reality of deteriorating marriages and friendships, debilitating and life-destroying addiction. There are many of you here in this room who are not okay. And our world, according to Ephesians, the good news is one that is darkly and devastatingly disordered. Our world, according to Ephesians, is a world that is not okay. And according to Ephesians, we have been shaped, battered, bruised, dehumanized, and unmade by both our contributions to and by being victims of that disordered world. For those of us who, like me, have seen up close and personally that not all prayers get answered how and when the way that we want them to be answered, who, like me, have realized that not all pro problems will go away with just a little bit of faith. If you follow Jesus, then everything will be better. Jesus tells a much different story than that, suggesting uh, pretty bluntly that if you follow me, things will most likely go worse for you than they will go better for you. For those who, like me, have felt the pain and anger of being looked in the eyes and told to your faces, you're good, you're good, it's fine, you're good. Being given a high five while you're drowning and suffering. I think Ephesians has something more substantive to offer you this morning. Because I think the risen Jesus has something more substantive to offer you this morning than just being okay. The story of Ephesians is a story that says, your being okay is okay, but it's also not okay. That your pain, your suffering, the evil that you endure, the evil that you are addicted to, the evil that you participate in, the evil that overcomes you and victimizes you is not okay, and that God in Christ has and is and will do something about that evil. But in the meantime, right now, we live in a world that is not okay. Ephesians tells us this in verse 16. The days are evil. Now, our translation of this is problematic, not because it's like bad translation from Greek into English. It's because our contemporary culture has an idea of what it means to make the most of the times. And this tends to lead, uh, lead towards like productivity, well, you better use your time wisely. And yet, this is not at all what Ephesians has in mind when Ephesians says, make the most of your time because the days are evil. This command is actually sandwiched between these ideas of cultivating wisdom in verses 14 and 15 and being foolish in verse 17. And all of this language is language that Paul has used throughout Ephesians to describe what the Spirit of God is up to among you bringing wisdom and insight and understanding, pulling you out of darkness and not understanding and foolishness. The previous former way of life is past. It's done for you anyways. And you have been invited by God's spirit through the person of Jesus Christ into a new way of life. But as you enter that new way of life, you enter it in a world that is not up to speed. You enter it in a world that is still in the dark, disordered, foolish, evil, chaotic one. One of my favorite films is Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. If you have not seen it, I strongly recommend that you watch it. Uh, it's rated R for those that that's a thing. I think there's a way to watch it without all of the rated R parts. But in it, my favorite character is Jobu Tupaki. And Jobu Tupaki creates a weapon to destroy the universe and everything bagel. And the everything bagel is a weaponized bagel meant to show the universe to itself. The bagel is meant to personify the fact that Jobu Tupaki has uh, come to the conclusion that nothing matters. That in a world of chaos, in a world where anything goes, in a world that is characterized by disorder, Everything will end in chaos. Everything will be brought in on itself and come to nothing. Therefore, nothing matters. 
And part of the reason I love the film, it's, it's incredibly creative and imaginative, and so just on that front, it's beautiful. But the other thing I love is this everything bagel of chaos and darkness that is sucking the universe into itself is one of the best depictions in film that I've ever seen of Paul's idea here that the days are evil. Sometimes when we hear this, we imagine like demons hiding behind bushes that are going to get you. And if you just pray enough, you put this like uh, protective layer of prayer around you, you will go out and you will be somehow inoculated from the demonic touch. And yet this is not at all what Paul is describing. We live in a world that is devolving into chaos because we live in a world where there is a power at work, a power that is seeking to still, steal, kill and destroy. Everything that's good, everything that's beautiful, everything that is love, this power wants to consume and bring to nothing, especially you. And so this phrase, make the most of the time because the days are evil, has nothing to do with time management, but is instead articulating your vocation, follower of Jesus in the world, your task, your mission, your calling, the real invitation. When Jesus says, come and follow me, this is what he is asking you to do, to love the world, the chaotic, dark, all-consuming world that God loved in Christ. Christ says, now go and love it the way that I have. The timeline that you are in is evil. This age is characterized by evil. The world is being swallowed by evil. Happy Mother's Day. (laughs) You in Christ are called to transform this world by embodying the hope of Jesus to a weary world. By bringing the reality of God's kingdom into the brokenness of this current evil age. John Chrysostom, the ancient church father, says this about this verse. Paul is saying, the times do not belong to you. Now you are migrants, expats, strangers, and foreigners. So don't seek honors in a world of evil and chaos. Don't seek glory in a world of evil and chaos. Don't seek authority or retribution in a world of evil and chaos. Instead, bear all things. Makes me think of Jesus. Only by patience will you be able to redeem these times. And Chrysostom's imagination is soaked in a God who overcomes violence with self-surrender who overcomes evil with goodness, who overcomes hatred with forgiveness and darkness with the light of divine love. Chrysostom's imagination is soaked in a crucified God. And he understands that the invitation to live and show up and embody this crucified God's hope in a world is to love itself sacrificially. But this invitation to make the most of the times is also in verse 17, we see clearly an invitation to figure out what God is up to and to join him. This is, doesn't have to be a mystery. God is at work in the world. Aslan is on the move, as C.S. Lewis so beautifully put it. And there is a real invitation not to sit back and watch God work, but to show up and work with him. And so do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Acknowledging and reimagining the world that we live in, we can then come to terms with Jesus' invitation to show up into the world differently. As embodied representatives of him and the goodness of creation and its God in this present evil age. And we can know that doing so will not always inevitably inevitably lead to our good. In other words, sometimes following Jesus will mean that in this world, you will not be okay. How?
how we're invited to live in the world that is not okay is as people who know what being okay even really actually means. One of the things that the story of Jesus redefines for us is a definition of success, a definition of the good life, a definition of what does it mean to really actually live a good, whole, beautiful human existence. We might have thought that being okay meant sitting on the couch and binging Netflix and I don't know, whatever your, like, your dream scenario of, of being okay is. Maybe that's telling for me. <laughs> but Jesus has a far more robust, far more grand vision of what it means to flourish as a human being. And we're able to take that and then offer it up to the world to put on display, to show them what okay possibly could even begin to mean. What I'm saying is we are a people of justice. Justice in the sense that we are going to help bring the peace of God to the world, the wholeness and healing of God to the world. A world filled with chaos, a world filled with evil, a world where injustice is the rule of the day, and I can't help but notice that so many of the world's solutions to injustice is injustice on the other side. We got to take the power away from them so that we can have the power. <laughs> we have to oppress them so that they can stop oppressing us. Jesus doesn't call us to arms. Jesus doesn't call us to violence or coercion or control or manipulation. Jesus calls us to self-giving love. Jesus calls us to a place of weakness, not of strength. And it's important to remember that chapter five of Ephesians starts with an invitation to imitate God. Be imitators of God, Paul says. Walk in love, Paul says. And the rest of the book is teasing out the particulars of how this is even done, what this begins to look like. I think part of our frustration with this is that it looks so granular and so small and so practical and so real in ways that makes this really hard. It's easy to love an idea out there. It's really, really, really difficult to love my roommate. It's easy to love the problem out there, the systematic structural injustices out there need to go, and I can side with the things that are trying to topple them. That part is easy. But loving my next door neighbor, who I really know and is very human, that can be art. Ephesians is going to describe the smaller, practical, day-to-day -day grind that is following Jesus in a world characterized by evil. And we'll, be, uh, we'll do well to remember that our invitation is not a quick fix to snap our fingers and the world will all of a sudden be okay, but a daily way of our faithfully showing up to the world in a certain way, a cross-shaped way, a loving way. And at the granular level, Paul describes the gist of our community that shows up in opposing communal behaviors, right? So rather than acting unwisely, we are to act wisely. Rather than those who lack discernment or judgment, we are to be people who know what God is up to in the world and who are joining him in it. Rather than being drunk with wine, living an unrestrained life, we are instead called to be filled with God's spirit. Now, uh, note on this. Right, for many of us, including me, who went to a conservative college where Bible was our middle name, who grew up in conservative churches, we are hearing all of these as individual commands. And this is a, a random bullet point where Paul is like, oh yeah, don't do this, and maybe don't do this, and, right? and then this is one of the, like, hey, don't drink. I grew up Baptist. Right, Baptists who invented Welch's because like we can't drink to the level that like wine is not appropriate in communion. Let's invent something that's still kind of wine without the alcohol. That's where grape juice came from, y'all, isn't that great? The Baptist contribution to the world. Where in the world was I going with that? 
So this is not an individual command that is suggesting, hey, you should never drink, or hey, you individual, don't ever get drunk, right? And, and that's not to say that we ought to or that we should, but rather what, what we miss here is this is a collective call to a community in a world in Ephesians where it would have been very common for any sort of collective religious practice to involve drunkenness, debauchery, all right, think uh, Mardi Gras. Many of, many of the Mardi Gras parades that you may have heard about because none of y'all would ever have gone to them <laughs> are, are named after some of these Roman parades. Bacchus, the god of the wine. But they were known for their religious festivals to be drunken orgies, if I can be blunt. Well, if you're sitting on the couch and you're drinking some wine, I don't think you're in the midst of a drunken orgy. And I don't think that's what Paul is trying to tell you not to do here. But rather, as a community, we are not participating in that sort of joyous life. We are participating in an alternative, a subversive type of joyous life. In this being drunk with wine is this, uh, this element of an unrestrained nature, that they are drinking all the wine up, that there's no more left. Drink and eat for tomorrow you die, Paul quotes them elsewhere. Being filled with the Spirit is being filled with some level of restraint in an evil age, some level of soberness in an evil age, some level of alertness in a world that is out to get you. And this is what Paul is inviting this community of faith into. And so the way that we are filled with God's spirit is going to be remarkably benign. If you're expecting tongues of fire from Paul here, this is not where we get them. He says, look, you want to be filled with the spirit? Then sing. Sing to each other. Sing hymns to each other. These are like songs that tell the story of what God is up to in Jesus. And sing psalms to each other. Sing spiritual songs to each other. This is how we embody the filling of God's presence among us. We sing. The contrast of a community not participating in collective drunkenness and foolishness, but instead a community where songs and hymns or spiritual songs have the potency to fill them with the same type of ecstatic joy. That's the power of God's spirit at work among the people of God. And so the spirit of of God's presence will be manifest when the church engages in certain sorts of community habits and practices. And so this language of filling that's used here, I don't want it to be mysterious for us. It's actually language that Paul has used throughout the book of Ephesians. The language of filling is language that's found in Ephesians chapter one when Paul says that the body of of the collective group of Jesus followers is in fact the body of Christ. The church is the fullness of Christ. He says later in chapter two, it is God's temple, the dwelling place of the victorious Christ. In the same way that God has filled the temple in the Old Testament, that God made his presence manifest at the center of his gathered people, God by his spirit is present as Christ reigns in and with us in our gathering. And so Paul asks then in chapter three that our community would be filled with the fullness of God. And then in four, that the community's formation into the fullness of the shape of Christ would take place. So by the time we get to chapter five, we should have had our fill with being Phil, dun dun Oh, come on. That was, that was a weak giggle. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. We are called to be a sort of community that is meant to participate in that fullness by embodying the reality that we are God's dwelling place within this place of evil. Right? Let, let me make this really, really practical. We gather together, we encounter, or we are encountered by the living God, and then we are sent out so that God is now encountering your neighbors through you. That if if my neighbor wants to encounter God apart from showing up among us, they will encounter you. I don't know why God decided to do it that way, but that's the way God seems to have decided to do it, that the people of God would be the presence of God in the world that is dark 
and decaying and dying, which means we have a job. That we're not just kicking it until Jesus returns. We're not just sitting back, twiddling our thumbs, living our best American lives, stacking up checks and grabbing bags until Jesus comes back. (laughs) The younger people are telling on themselves. We are the embodied presence of God within a broken world. And Paul invites us to actually really embody that to a broken world. And so we praise and we give thanks and we become a weird little community of people who do weird things on a Sunday morning when all the other world, the rest of the world gets to go to brunch. And in doing this, we acknowledge that even here, even now, even when I'm not okay, God's goodness is still breaking through. I swear it is, I promise. (laughs) I'm convinced of this. Finally, and most importantly, they are to order this community is to order themselves appropriately as a community in the fear of Christ who reigns victoriously over the cosmos, submitting to one another in sacrificial love for one another. This is the the anchor at the end of this passage that begins with, hey, you should imitate God, you should walk in love, ends with, and really here's kind of a summation of all of it, just submit yourselves to one another. Submit yourselves to one another. What does this mean? Simply put, Among God's people, there is no place for domination, manipulation, control, or exploitation. We are a people of confession. We are a people of forgiveness. We are a people of mercy and grace. We are a people of giving and not taking. In short, we are a people of love, a cross-shaped love that looks like the love of Jesus because the love of Jesus looks like the love of God. Chrysostom says this about our singing. You wish to be happy? You wanna know how to spend the day truly blessed? I offer you a drink that is spiritual, a spirit, if you will. Learn to sing the Psalms. Then you will see pleasures indeed. In the midst of the worst timeline ever, we become a people of joy. Not because everything's okay. Not because all is right with the world. Not because we got it going on and we've praised Jesus and we are truly blessed, too blessed to be stressed. But instead, in the midst of the worst timeline ever, we are filled with joy because we know the one who resurrects the dead. We know the one who has been to hell itself and come back. We know the one who is reigning over the cosmos and at work in the world making all things new. And we sing to him. And we remind each other of who he is and what he's like in our singing together. And we are filled with real joy. In conclusion, what Paul is getting at here is he's putting together a reimagining of our stories. Our stories that are caught up in and wrapped up in the story of a crucified God and so that we become new creatures, a new humanity, a new creation breaking into the old, the kingdom of God breaking in, the extension of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, an extension of the love of the Father, an extension of the communion of the Holy Spirit in the broken and weary and dark world. We are commissioned, sent out with a vocation as a new humanity to counteract the forces of decay with the real reality of resurrection, the real hope of renewal. And so our question becomes not, how do I win this person to Christ? But when I show up into a room, into a situation, into a reality with these redemptive dynamics of the cross in play, how do I love this person the way that Christ currently is loving them? How do I see this person the way that Jesus currently sees this person? 
In short, we are being sent out by God to bless the world by loving it, to make the world a better place because we are in it, because God is in us. And so we do not love for our own sake. Uh, A friend of mine recently put it this way. Jesus has commanded us to love other people and we often take that to mean our task is to go and convince other people to come and love our thing. That me loving my neighbor simply means, well, you have to come to my church for me to love you, right? Please, invite your friends to church. But please, don't only ever invite your friends to church. Also invite them to brunch and to your living room and to Christmas dinner and to come over one evening and hang out and to watch their kids and to be a good neighbor. What would it look like for us to love people simply because they're worth loving? What would it mean to love people in their thing instead of trying to love them so that they can come and love our thing? We don't love for our sake. We love for their sake because that's how God loves.